Good morning. We're so excited to worship Jesus with you today. If you are a first time guest with us online or in person, please connect with us online at c1.church or with the connect card in the backs of the seats. We'd love to connect with you and let you know what's happening here at C1. Thank you so much for being faithful in your giving. If you'd like to give in tithe, offering, or missions, you could do so by dropping it off in the black boxes by either entrances, or you can give at C1 the church or text your amount to 84321. Guys, today is going to be an awesome day. Let's celebrate Jesus and, wor- and worship together.
Open up my eyes Or show me Who you are and feel We'll sing holy, holy, and holy There is no one like you there Come on, make this your prayer this morning. Show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those who and I will build my life upon your love. It is. Mm -hmm. And I will put my trust. Mm -hmm. You're the firm foundation. And holy, there is no one like you, and there is no one beside you. In your And all the saints and angels that bow before your throne, and all the endless cats, the crowns of full land of God, and say, say, you worthy of it all. And all the saints and angels that bow before your throne, and all the endless cast, the crowns before the Just echo the throne room of heaven this morning. Day and night, night and day, let worship arise. Day and night, night and day. Sing day and night. Day and night, night and day, let worship arise. Day and night, night and day, let worship arise.
And to you are all things you deserve, glory. Come on, let's sing it to him this morning. Sing, you're worthy. You're worthy of it all. All we have to give is yours. You're worthy of it all. Mm. For from you are all things. And to you are all things. You deserve all. It's yours, it's yours. You were the other all. You size, every one of us has brought something different. Every one of us is walking with a different need, a different, a different worry, a different, a different anxiety, a different fear. And I also know this, that God is here and in his presence, fear has no voice his presence he turns depression to joy he turns he turns weeping into gladness he changes ashes and he gives you beauty in his presence things change so as <laughs> as you come as you are and we walk into the very presence in the, the throne room of God and he inhabits his praises. God is here to meet with you. He's here to walk with you. There are people in this room that have been worried sick. There are people in this room that are facing sickness, physical sickness. There are people in this room that have had ba a bad week. I am here to tell you that God is with you and that if God is with you, what can be against you? He loves you and he has not abandoned you. God, I pray right now for your people right now as, as we are going to transition into worship through your word, I pray for your people. Lord, I pray that you will move, uh, tear down walls of bondage that, that have plagued people's mindsets, Lord, as we present ourselves as a living sacrifice, pure and holy and pleasing to you. Lord, this is a reasonable service. Your word tells us that you change the way we think. I pray that as we launch into this message today, that you change the way we think, that we might receive receive what you would have for us and we walk out of here changed not not bound to the same things that we walked in here with not set not bound to, to to the same passions and desires but lord i pray that you change us let us walk out of here transformed because we encountered god almighty lord if there, are, there if there is depression i release joy if there's anxiety, I release peace in the name of Jesus. If there's addiction, I release freedom. Lord, I thank you. I thank you. I thank you that you are here. Holy Spirit, I pray that you will help me to say exactly what you would have me to say. Lord, I, I know this. I don't need me. I need you. This church doesn't need me, they need you. So Holy Spirit, I pray that you speak. Help me to be your oracle and your mouthpiece in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. 
God's good. God is good all the time. He's good. He's good. Today we are going to look at a whole book of the Bible. We're going to read it from start to finish. So just buckle up. We're going to be here till next Sunday. We're going to be looking at Jude. It's one chapter. So it's 24 verses. We're going to launch into a series next week called Christmas in July. And we're going to look at the gifts of the Spirit and the, and the gifts. Like there, There's different groups of gifts that the God gives us. He, he gives us gifts. Um, God the Father, God the Son, and the Holy Spirit. There's groups. And I want, we're going to kind of dive into those next week. And over the course of, the, of this month, we're going to look at the, the gifts that God gives to the church. And he gives each gifts for different reasons. And um, some of you guys d- maybe not even know that God has gifts for you. And um, I think it's time that the church opens them and starts using them. You know, what good is a gift if we're not using it, Right? It's like the anticipation to Christmas. They're just wrapped up under the tree, but you can't play with them. So uh, I pray that next week as we dive into the the different sets of gifts that's listed out in the Word of God, that the anticipation builds and and that we take and uh, get ready because God has gifts for you. God has gifts that he wants you to use, and and he he didn't just give them to you for them to collect dust and um, sit there in your life. He wants you to use them in a tangible way. But today, um, I I, I honestly thought about launching into the series this week, but as I was praying, I felt like the Lord said, no, no, hold off, hold off, hold off. And so as I'm sitting here praying this week, I'm like, Lord... I need to know where to go. You know, Sundays roll around once a week. I don't know if you guys knew that. And um, usually I, I, I'm the one speaking, and I don't want to just get up here and speak anything. I want to speak something that's going to challenge the church to be the church. With that said, before we get into the Word, I want to tell you a dad joke. And then we're going to get into the Word. I've been reading a book in Braille. And uh, I just feel like something good's coming. Some of you guys will get that next week. All right. Oh, look at your neighbor and say, today's going to be a good day. It's going to be a good day. It's already a good day. So let's look. Jude, verse 1. This letter is from Jude, a slave of Jesus Christ and a brother of James. I want you to see this. I don't know if you guys know this, but this is really interesting. But when Christ came and died and rose again, like he confirmed to his followers and to the world, like, okay, he really is the son of God. When he ascended to heaven, he rose, like, he, he, rose from the dead. He predicted his own death, then he rose from the dead. Yeah. Have they seen other people get raised from the dead? Absolutely. But when Jesus got raised from the dead, and then on top of that, you know, he's like appearing in rooms, disappearing out of rooms. He's doing all this stuff. Like the other people that raised from the dead weren't doing this stuff. And then he's sitting there talking to his disciples, and suddenly Jesus is just floating up to heaven, and they're like, Okay, now he can fly, and then he disappears, and he's up in heaven, and, and it confirmed. Like, the disciples, like, were so shaken by this. And then the Holy Spirit came on them, and he filled them with power to be witnesses and to perform miracles. All these things, it confirmed so hard in them that Jesus is God, even though he said he was God. But now it's like, wow, no, like, he's God. So Jude, Jude is a brother of James. Now, I'm going to do some math for you, kind of. But we know James is Jesus' brother. 
That means Jude, we have two, we have, we have two letters in the Bible from Jesus' literal flesh and blood brothers, James and Jude. But I want you to see this. Jude quit looking at Jesus as his brother and started looking at him as God. Imagine growing up with Jesus, and that's your older brother. But here Jude is identifying as a slave of Jesus and a brother of James because Jesus so radically saved him. Jude is one of the guys that used to tell Jesus how he should do his ministry. He was one of those dudes. He'd be like, Jesus, you need to take this on the road. You need to go up. And Jesus is like, you can go up at any time, but don't tell me how to do what the Holy Spirit can only do. You know, like Jude used to try to boss Jesus around in his ministry. It's, it's, in, it's in, through the Gospels because it would say Jesus' brothers would come to him or, or they would be ashamed of Jesus. Like, Jesus, your family wants you. Your brothers and sisters are here because they're kind of ashamed of him. And Jesus is like, you guys are my brothers and sisters. And, but Jesus so radically saved Jude that he starts identifying no longer as a brother of Jesus, but as a brother of James and a slave of Jesus. That's what happens when you meet Jesus. He transforms the way you look at him. He transforms the way you look at him. I'm writing to you all, I'm writing to you all who have been called by God the Father, who whose love, who loves you and keeps you safe in the care of Jesus Christ. May God give you more and more mercy, peace, and love. Dear friends, I have been eagerly planning to write you about the salvation we all share, but now I find that I must write you about something else. Urging you, I, I need us to see this. This is so urgent that Jude had been wanting to talk to the church about salvation, but now the Holy Spirit's laying something so heavy on his heart that he's changing this epistle to the church that he might pastor them in this moment. And as I was reading this this week, I wasn't planning on preaching out of Jude, but I kept coming back to Jude, and I felt like I need to do the same thing today. Because we're at a moment in time that the church is very divided. The nation's very divided over a myriad of different issues. And I think as, as the church, we can get lost in the division with our political preference, with our, um, with our opinions about political issues, that we lose sight of the most important thing, our faith in Jesus. And we can actually let our persuasions and our opinions and our, and our convictions to, to push out what we need to do as the church. And that's what was happening then. And Jude is trying to course correct the church. And he's saying, I have to urge you. You must, you, 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 you need to defend the faith that God has entrusted once for all time to his holy people. And I want to hit on this word defend because it's kind of, there's not really good, good translation of what it really means. But it's the word apologia. It's where we get the word apologetics. And it's not so much as a defense, even though that's how we read it. It's more of you need to be able to give a reason for why you believe what you believe. That's what it really means. So when people come at you and start questioning, why do you believe in Jesus? Jude here, and also Peter says the same thing. It's that word apologia, or we get the word apologetics, a defense for your faith, but you're not defending God. Number one, he doesn't need you to defend him. 
You're not defending your faith. It's a better understanding is give a reason why you believe it. Like let people understand why you believe it. We, we say it this way here at C1. We share our story. Give the reason. Tell people what Jesus has done for you. Dear friends, I've, okay, let's, let's keep going. I say this because some ungodly people have wormed their way into your churches. All right, who is it? No, I'm joking. I'm joking. Gosh, now I just made it awkward. Everyone's like, it's not me. That's exactly what someone would say. No, stop it, Ryan. Saying that God's marvelous grace allows us to live immoral lives. This is written 30 years after Jesus died. Satan's been beating that same drum for the last 2,000 years. God's grace transforms you to live a holy life. It empowers you. God's grace empowers you. My grace is sufficient for my power is made. Like, that, that's, Paul says his, God's grace equals his power right there. God's grace empowers you to live a holy life. So to understand what, what Jude is saying is we've got to understand grace. Grace is getting something you don't deserve. That's essentially what grace is. Grace is getting what you don't deserve. And because God gives it freely, he empowers you because you don't deserve it to live a holy life. But from the beginning, people have tried to convince you because God's grace is too good to be true, and it really is, but it's true because that's how God is. God is true, and everything he does is too good to be true. I mean, like he came to earth that died for our sin. That's too good to be true, and he did it anyways. Everything about God is too good to be true, and yet it's true. And, but what, what the devil has always tried to convince, because you're under grace, you can live however you want. And, and we have people in churches saying the same thing today. We have Christians that are, they, they, they've said a prayer, but there was no life transformation after the prayer. The proof of your salvation isn't a prayer that you pray, it's transformation. You're letting the Holy Spirit sanctify you over the course of time. And, and he says, the condemnation of such people was recorded long ago, for they have denied our holy master and Lord Jesus Christ. What, what, what Jude is saying here is he, he's, he's saying that they're not making Jesus Lord. They're listening to themselves over Jesus. Let's keep going. So I want to remind you, though you already know these things, that Jesus first rescued the nation of Israel out of Egypt, but later he destroyed those who did not remain faithful. And I, want, and I remind you of the angels who did not stay within the limits of authority God gave them, but left the place where they belong. God has kept them securely chained in prisons of darkness, waiting for the great day of judgment. And don't forget Sodom and Gomorrah and their neighboring towns, which were filled with immorality and every kind of sexual perversion. Those cities were destroyed by fire and serve as a warning of the internal fire of God's judgment. Like, oh, this is a really encouraging message, Ryan. In the same way, these people who claim authority from their dreams, so, so what's happening, and, and people do this all the time, and, and, and you could tell is, like, the, the new phrase that's happening across the church is deconstruction. Like, I'm de deconstructing my faith, but the problem with deconstruction I, 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 is, is that, they're, they're dissecting the word of God and they're saying, okay, I don't want to believe this because it conflicts with what I think. And so I'm going to believe this. I like this part, so I'm going to stand on that. But, but this over here doesn't line up with me. But, and, and so the, I'm all for people wrestling to the ground what they believe. But the foundation for what you believe has got to always be the word of God. God doesn't need an editor he has one. His name's the Holy Spirit. And so when we wrestle to the ground, why we believe what we believe, the foundation comes out of the word of God. And that's a strong foundation. It is the end all for our faith. 
And so we, we don't get the right to pick and choose out of the word of God what to believe or what to, or, or because what ends up happening is as we do this, we actually end up starting to create a God of our own design and that's called idolatry because we start making Jesus look like, oh, well, Jesus didn't really ever talk about this, but the character of God over the course of time, he did. And maybe Jesus in the four gospels might not have directly addressed something, but if you want to look at the word of God, the word of God is Jesus in book form, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. God addresses things. And, and we don't get the right to dissect it. We don't get the right to take out it and put back in. And, and what's happening here is these people are claiming, I had a dream. And this is what the Lord told me. And I think that this is how we should live. Or I think that what God really meant. And, and that's not how we live. We go to the word of God and the Holy Spirit illuminates it to us. But if it contradicts the character of the word of God or the word of God, it's not from God. And, and Jude is addressing this because these people are leading people away from the Jesus of the Bible into a Jesus of their own design. They live immoral lives. They defy authority and scoff at supernatural beings. But even Michael, one of the mightiest of angels, did not dare accuse the devil of blasphemy, but simply said, the Lord rebuke you. This took place when Michael was arguing with the devil about Moses' body. But these people scoff at things they do not understand. Like unthinking animals, they do whatever their instincts tell them. I want you to hear that. They do whatever their instincts tell them. That's the dumbest thing you can do because our instincts are horribly stupid we're like one of the few mammals that actually don't have instincts built into our DNA and so they bring about their own destruction what sorrow awaits them for they follow in the footsteps of Cain who killed his brother like Balaam they deceive people for money, and like Korah, they perish in their rebellion. When these people eat with you in your fellowship meals commemorating the Lord's love, they are like dangerous reeves that can shipwreck you. They are like shameless shepherds who care only for themselves. They are like clouds blowing over the land without giving any rain. They are like trees in autumn that are doubly dead, for they bear no fruit and have been pulled up by the roots. Jude does not have a lot of kind things to say about people who don't follow God's word, that claim to be God's people. They are like wild waves of the sea, churning up foam of their shameful deeds. They are like wandering stars, doomed forever in the blackest darkness. Enoch, who lived in the seventh generation after Adam, prophesied about these people. He said, listen, the Lord is coming with countless thousands of his holy ones to execute judgment on the people of the world. He will convict every person of all the ungodly things they have done and for all the insults that ungodly sinners have spoken against him. These people are grumblers and complainers living only to satisfy their desires. That goes back to they follow their own instincts. They live to satisfy their own desires. They, they, they me, me, me. They brag loudly about themselves and they flatter others to get what they want. But you, but you, I love when God puts a conjunction, junction, what's your function in there? Because he's about to shift the script because this, is, this has been heavy so, so far. Jude is warning the church. He's saying, hey, I care enough for you for you to watch out for this. Because it's not, not just happening then, it's happening now. People saying, well, God didn't mean that. Well, what does his word say? I think God didn't stutter. He didn't mix words. I think he said what he meant. He's not a woman. Oh, oh, come on, Ryan. Ah, I'm sorry. I just lost half of you guys. <sighs> Verse 
But he puts a but. He said, but you, my dear friends, must remember what the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ predicted. They told you that in the last times, there would be scoffers whose purpose in life is to satisfy their ungodly desires. They live for themselves. These people are the ones who are creating divisions among you. They follow their natural instincts because they do not have God's spirit in them. Jude unintentionally just gave us a litmus test for our faith. Because if we constantly lean back on, I think we should do this, or I should, without praying or, or listening or even trying to find the will of God, maybe God's spirit's not in you. We seek God in everything. Everything. Let's keep going. But you, dear friends, listen. Must build each other up in your most holy faith. Pray in the power of the Holy Spirit. And await the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will bring you eternal life. In this way, you will keep yourself safe in God's love. Oh man, yeah, that's so encouraging. God's love is a place of safety. And you must show mercy to those whose faith is wavering. And you must rescue others by snatching them from the flames of judgment. And you must show mercy still to others, but do so with great caution, hating the sins that contaminate their lives. Now all glory to God who is able to keep you from falling away and will bring you with great joy into his glorious presence without a single fault. All glory to him who alone is God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord. All glory, majesty, power, and authority are his before all time and in the present and beyond all time. Amen. Today, I want to talk to you about the must of the church. It's going to get musty in here. Man, he's full of dad jokes today. Gosh. The first must I want to hit you with is we must defend our faith. We must defend our faith. Jude gave this charge to the church as he's identifying things that are happening to the church that contradict the spirit and the character of God. And, he, and he's saying, I'm urging you to defend what you believe, to, to give a reason why you believe it, remind people, because there, there will be people that, that will come here, there will be people that, that will be in your life that will not have a biblical view on things even though they will claim to follow Jesus. And or they will start siding with the things of the world and start taking the world's perspective on issues that contradicts the heart of God on issues. And if we start having the perspective of the world and it contradicts what God holds dear, we are not letting the Holy Spirit renew us. Because the Holy Spirit's job over the course of our life is to make us like Jesus. He makes us act like Jesus he makes us talk like Jesus. He makes us think like Jesus. He makes us pray like Jesus. He makes us like Jesus, and this is called sanctification. And when we make Jesus Lord and King of our life, 
we come into submission to the Holy Spirit. And the Bible says in 1 Corinthians, he says, we are not our own. We were bought with a price. Don't you know that your body, your physical body is the temple of the Holy Ghost? That means that we don't get a right. <laughs> it's his. Paul echoes this in Romans chapter 12. He says, present yourself as a living sacrifice. So if you find yourself coming in agreement with the world on things where the world contradicts the word of God, we probably aren't letting the Holy Spirit renew us. If God was okay with us listening to our whims, passions, and our own instincts, he would not have sent the Holy Spirit to lead us. He wouldn't have. I mean, it's really quiet in here. I'm sorry. I... I feel like I need to say this, though, because we are the church, and we are called to be led of the Spirit. We are called to love like Jesus, and we are called to, be, to do what he tells us to do, to say what he tells us to say, to act how he has us to act. And I'm, and I'm, I'm not trying to step on anyone's toes. I'm, I'm just, honestly, I'm, I'm just saying what I feel like I need to say. Jude warns so strongly against listening to our own whims and passions. The Bible says our heart is filled with every kind of evil desire. The worst advice, and you hear it all the time, the worst advice a person can get is follow your heart. That's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. Because your heart is so fickle, it will lead you astray every single time. What we're supposed to do as a follower of Jesus is to bring our heart to God and say, this is yours. Lead me. I can't listen to myself. How many of you guys have listened to your heart and got yourself in a lot of trouble? Yeah, me, I, dude, there was one time when I was a sophomore in college and before me laid a decision to get engaged or to break up. And I followed my heart, and it led to a three-year engagement where I ended up breaking up with her. If your choices in life come down to get engaged or break up, you should probably break up. If you <laughs> Getting engaged is not going to fix the issues in your relationship. We're not called to listen to our heart. And, and the, problem, the problem is with listening to our heart is it skews our, our view of, of what God's word says because it, it makes reasonable sense, right? It makes logical sense. Oh, yeah, that, that's logical. The problem is with logic and reason is it's not always how God operates, God's thoughts are infinitely higher than our thoughts. So he hardly ever makes logical sense when he tells us to step in faith, when he tells us to do something. So the Bible actually says his thoughts are as far above our thoughts as the stars are to the earth. So if it doesn't make logical sense, but you feel like you need to do it and you've been praying about it, it's probably God telling you to do something because it takes faith to walk in it. If we listen to our own instincts, it will get us killed, both spiritually and physically. It, it, it just will. We are called to listen to the Spirit. We are called to go back. And, and maybe you're at this point where, well, I don't feel like God's speaking to me. I, I understand that. I've been there. Like, God, what are you saying? Well, number one, go to the Word of God. Open the word of God. Learn the word of God. 
Rest in the word of God. Read the word of God. If we are being filled up with all these other things, news sources, uh, movies, whatever, and, and we're like, God, where are you? And, and we're neglecting the word of God. His number one way to communicate to his people is the word of God. And he will speak to you through the word of God. And he will, he, will give, he will enlighten you. He will help you understand. He will help you make decisions just by studying the word of God. Because it, the word of God captures the heart of God. And then suddenly when you know the heart of God, it's easy to look at a situation and say, that's not in line with the heart or the word of God. So I know I should not do that. Because it, it's in contradiction. We are literally seeing this play out before our eyes. In our society today, in churches today, we are seeing a shift. And Jude challenges, defend the faith, give a reason why you believe, and it starts with the word of God. We don't get to edit it, we don't get to, we don't get to dissect it, we don't get, that's the foundation if you want to wrestle down to why I believe what I believe, go back to the Word of God and build from there. And I would love to have conversation. Get men and women of God around you and help them build. Help, 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 help them. Let them help you wrestle to the ground. But in, in, our, in our walk, we, are, we must defend what we believe. And if we find ourselves agreeing with what the world believes... That, that's a test to show that we aren't being renewed by the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit makes us think like Jesus. He renews us. He changes us. And in the, in the, in the months and the years to come, you guys are going to have conversations, and I'm going to have conversations with people that don't think the way I do and that, the way you do, and we need to give them a reason why we believe what we believe. In fact, this... This last week and this conversation that I'm about to share with you did not happen for the sermon illustration, but it's a perfect example. It's like God always like, I'm going to throw him a bone. But I was at the gym and I started talking to a person at the gym. And um, the, the conversation went, uh, it went a direction I did not expect it to go. Have you guys ever had those conversations? I'm like, oh, okay, we're going to go here. So... Um, but I was talking to this young woman at the gym, and she asked me uh, what I thought God's gender was. Um, him, her, or they. And, like, I'm not going to get into any of that. And I'm like, well, like, this is clearly a God moment because I think I should have a conversation with this. And it was so cordial. It was a beautiful conversation. It wasn't a debate. It wasn't any of that. And I said, well... The Bible, like I live my life by the word of God, the Bible, and the Bible says that God is spirit. That's what he is. And uh, I said, Jesus came in the form of a man. He has a physical body. He is a male, but God is spirit. And so we started talking some more, and, and then she's like, I kind of believe that everyone's right. She's like, I just believe that Christianity's right, Islam's right, you know, and I was like, well, let's talk about the top five, like um, Buddhism, Islam, Christianity, Catholicism, um, Hinduism. Let, let's just dive into those real quick. I said, Let, let's just say they're all right. And I'm just having this conversation. I said, but here's the problem. Every one of these religions are exclusive. They really are. Christianity is the only religion that's 100% inclusive. We want everyone to come, but we're exclusive in this sense that we believe that Jesus Christ is the only way of salvation. No other way. We only come to the Father but through Christ. But I said, but the problem is Islam believes their way is right, and it's exclusive. You can only get to heaven through Islam. Hinduism thinks they're exclusive. You can only get to the next life through, you know, I'm, like every one of them is exclusive. I said, well, let's, let's just think about this. Because if they're all right, then none of them are right. They're all wrong. <laughs> you can't be all right when there's exclusivity, exclusivity. Only one can be right. 
And she's like, oh, that's interesting. And so I said, well, let's think about this too. I mean, like every one of these other religions is work-based. So we try to get to God. Like Islam, you have to, you, you don't know whether God loves you or not. So you kind of have to work towards him. And he's kind of a cold, distant God in Islam. He doesn't interact with his creation. Hinduism, if you have to offset your karmic debt to, in order to reincarnate Buddhism, you, you have to kind of, you have to work at relinquishing all your desires here on earth. And like, it's always work. I said Christianity is set apart because we can't get to God, period. Even Catholicism, say this many Hail Marys, say this many Our Fathers. It's work, it's, it, it falls back on us. And we can't do it. So, but Christianity is different in the sense that God came to us and did the work so that we can get to God. And I got to share the gospel with her and why I believe what I believe in just a conversation at the gym. And it was really cool. I would love to say that she was transformed and the Holy Spirit fell or anything. No, that didn't happen. But she got to hear the gospel and a reason why why we believe what we believe. And it was all out of the word of God. And so the, 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 second, the second thought I want to leave, leave with you, this has 10 points to it. I'm just joking. But we must build each other up, pray in the power of the Holy Spirit, and await Jesus' mercy. I need us to hear this. I added, I added this section this morning because the Lord really laid on my heart Thursday. He said, I want you to do what Jude's telling us to do, to build each other up. And I've been praying about how to do that since Thursday. And I sat here this morning, I'm like, Lord, I know you want me to do this, but I don't know how you want me to do this. But I know that there are people here today that need to hear what I'm about to say. There are people here today that feel so beat up and tattered. There are people here today that your faith is wavering and you're wrestling and you, you, you might even be saying, God, where are you? And I know that God laid this on my heart because someone needs to hear what I'm about to speak over you. So I would hate to just talk about how to build each other up. We pray for one another. We share each other's burdens. You know, I can give you examples or I can just do it. And I'm going to just give you one example. There's a million ways to build each other up. You can call each other. You can check in on each other. You can do all sorts of things. Go out to dinner, have coffee, whatever. There's a lot of ways to build each other up in your most holy faith. There's not one. But I'm going to speak over you what God says about you. And someone, might be multiple people, need to hear this. This is God's opinion of you. You are dead to sin and alive in Christ. You might feel dead and you're like, I just, I'm worn out. I'm physical. I'm just... But the Bible says in Romans 6.11, you are alive in Christ. You are a child of God. I think sometimes in church we say that so often that it loses its gravitas. But you are a child of the most high God. You are the righteousness of God in Christ. That's who you are. You are God's righteousness. You have right standing. You are spotless before him. You might feel condemned. The enemy might have been saying, you are such a sinner and a hypocrite. That is a filthy lie from the pit of hell. If your faith is in Jesus Christ, you are the righteousness of God in Christ. You are alive. You are Christ's ambassador. You represent heaven on earth. You are a masterpiece, Ephesians 2.10 says. You are chosen, Ephesians 1.4. You are a child of God. 
You are joyful, Galatians 5. You are gentle. You are not easily offended, and you don't hold on to bitterness. You are patient and faithful. You are self-controlled and kind. You are known before you were born. God made you. He chose half of your parents' DNA and um, half of your mom and half of your dad. They're, like The chances that you came into existence are like a trillion to one, but God chose to form you in the womb. He chose to let you walk on this earth. He, known, he has known you before you were born. You are steady, Psalm 91.1. You are not alone. God is with you, Matthew 28, 20. You are loved, John 3, 16. You are free. You might feel like you are bound, but that's not what God says. If you are in Christ, the Bible says it is for freedom he set us free. He says where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Where's the spirit of the Lord? It's in us. Whom the Son sets free is free indeed. You are free, John 8, 32. You are healed by Christ's stripes. It's not you might be healed. It's not you could be healed. It's you are healed. 1 Peter 2, 24. Stand on it. It's a promise. All God's promises are yes and amen. If you're dealing with something physical and your physical body stand on the word of God, it is a firm foundation. It will not fail. You are healed. Someone needs to hear that today. They are healed. You are unashamed, Romans 8.1. You are not condemned, Romans 8.1. <laughs> you are called and equipped to go after the righteous desires God puts in your heart. Peter says, everything we need for a holy life has been given to us in Christ Jesus. You are strong, 1 John 2, 14. You are fearless, Isaiah 43, 5. You are secure, John 10, 28 through 29. You are a new creation, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. For those who are in Christ, they are a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. You're not who you were, so keep rejoicing. You're not yet who God made you to be, so keep repenting. You are not shaken, Psalm 62, 6. You are not stuck in worry because Jesus offers a peace that the world cannot give. You are born again. You are not a victim. You are more than a conqueror. Romans 8, 37. You are named by God, not labeled by man. You are the light of the world, Matthew 5, 14. You are mighty in his power, Ephesians 6, 10. You are the church, and you exist for the world, to reach the world, 1 Corinthians 12, 27. That's what God says about you. That's his opinion of you. He loves you. We must encourage each other in the faith. We got to remind ourselves what God says. Because if we don't remind ourselves of what God says, the enemy will remind us of what he says. He'll remind us of who we were before Jesus. He'll take every opportunity to condemn you. He'll take every opportunity. He's going to anyways. We've got to encourage each other in our faith. We must build each other up. We must. And then it says, it says, we must pray in the power of the Holy Spirit. We must pray in the power of the Holy Spirit. God wants to answer your prayers. I heard this quote a couple weeks ago, but if God answered all your prayers today, would you be the only one affected? Oh! 
But when we pray in the power of the Holy Spirit, we can pray with the confidence that God is going to answer, that God is going to move, that God is going to show up, that God is going to realign, that God is going to move mountains because the power of God is at work within us. The same power that rose Christ from the dead lives in us. We must, in the, like, it's, the world's just getting worse and worse, and the church has got to shine more and more. And that's the cool thing about light. We are the light of the world, the Bible says. And so the darker it is, the better the light shines. So we got to pray. The, more, the darker it gets, the more power we got to pray in. We can't be timid in our prayer life. And we don't have to show any quarter to the enemy. And then he says, await Jesus' mercy. I love this. We need to understand what mercy is. We talked about what grace is earlier. Grace is getting what you don't deserve. Mercy is not getting what you do deserve. So Jude says that we are safe in the mercy of God. This is so significant. The reason why mercy is so so potent and powerful because the only way that we can rest in the mercy of God is by resting in it. And the only way we can rest in it is to be humble because mercy falls directly on God. It's up to him whether he shows it and he does show it. So we are throwing ourselves at his mercy. And, and, and what Jude is saying is God's mercy is a place that we can find rest. We can find safety that we, we can be okay but that takes complete and whole humility. You can't walk in pride and rest in mercy because what, what will end up happening is you will think that you can do something on your own, but it takes humility to come to God and say, I am only resting in your mercy because you have not smote me. That's a good old-fashioned word. But he's not going to. He loves you. But God's mercy... God's mercy, God's mercy is eternal, it's everlasting, and it's rooted in his love for us. And we can find rest in that, but the only way we can do that is through humility. It's through humility. We walk in mercy. His grace and mercy are always a safe bet to those who humble themselves and come to him. And the last thought I'm going to leave you with real quick is we must show mercy to those whose faith is wavering, rescue others from flames, and show mercy still to others. I got real creative with my points. I actually just pulled them straight out of the text. I love, this is the beauty of the kingdom of God. Because the very people that Jude is warning against in the first half of, that, of his letter are the very people that he's saying reach. The very people he's saying, these people will shipwreck your faith. He's saying, have mercy on them. Because we don't have a right to judge anyone. We're not the Holy Spirit and we're not God. Our job is to show mercy and the love of God. And no one's exempt from that. But he, he gives a hierarchy. Show mercy to those whose faith is wavering. People who are wrestling with their faith. People who are, are having a hard time walking out this, their faith. People who are like, man, the word of God says this, but man, I feel like this is... And, and they're wrestling with, with what they feel and what the word of God... And, and the Bible says, have mercy. That's not a time to condemn. That's a time to come alongside and say, let's talk about it. Let's go get some coffee. Let's, let's crack open the word of God and let's walk our faith out together. Because guess what? Not one of us is a finished work. I don't care if you've been a Christian for five minutes, one minute, or 50 years. The Holy Spirit is still making you like Jesus. And so our job is to come alongside each other and to love one another and to encourage one another, build each other up, and have mercy. That means not giving people what they deserve. If God doesn't give you what you deserve, and what we deserve is hell, and he gives us heaven, 
and he gives us relationship and he gives us love, he empowers us to do the same. Show mercy to those whose faith is wavering. Rescue others from the flame. These are people who don't even know Jesus. They're so lost. Like this young lady at the gym. She's so lost. She's like, I I just don't know about all that. That's okay. I can't wait to continue to have conversations about Jesus with her. Well, I, I believe one day she'll ask me to pray for her. I hope. But at the end of the day, this is such a sober reminder. People who don't know Jesus have a very real eternity before them. And if we're so consumed about us that we forget that God doesn't save us for this world to make our life easy here. He saves us for the world to come and that we are eternal. So we will end up going to heaven or hell at the end of the day. And the only way to get to heaven is through Jesus Christ. That should change how we interact with people who are far from Jesus Christ. We rescue others from flames. The flames of the pit of hell, literally. That's our job as a church. It's not just my job as a pastor. It's not just Andy's job or Phil's job or Amy's job or Nathan's job. It's our job. We have mercy and grace and we rescue them. I don't know if you guys have ever seen firemen go into a burning house. But quite frankly, they don't care about the doors that are in front of them. They bust it down. And you... And I've had conversations, well, I just got to wait for the, the, the timing to be right to share my faith. If you wait for the right timing, you'll never have the right moment. But when you start sharing your faith, every moment is the right moment. Every moment is the right moment. So we rescue others. We must rescue others from the flames. And then it says, we must show mercy still to others. These are, these are the people that are intentionally going out of their way to shipwreck you. These are the people that you might call them your enemy. <laughs> but what does Jesus say to do to your enemies? Yeah, let's just, let's, what, what, what does he say to do to your enemies? Pray, pray for them. Love them. What, what else does, like, like bless them. You can't do that if you're not showing mercy. (laughs) I know this is a heavy word today. I know. But I, I feel so heavy in my heart that there is this need to move forward. Not need to move forward. There is this need to to, to walk out even more now the, the, the calling on the church. I, I think that the harvest fields are so ripe and people need hope so much. People are putting, they're, they're looking for things to put their faith in. And quite frankly, right now they're putting their faith in political systems, political parties and governments and celebrities, they're, they're looking for places to put their faith in church. We must be filled with the mercy of God to one another and to the world and to show them where to put their faith properly. And, I, and, and you guys are so great at this, but we can never get away from this. This is the point of the church. This is the point of the church. And I'm like, I don't want anyone to be condemned. If you feel condemned, that's, that's not from Jesus. I want us to be challenged to walk out of here to say, I, I am the church. And God has called and equipped me to be the church. And to walk out of here in the mercy of God, filled with the mercy of God, to show the mercy of God. And so what we're going to do to end is I, I, I'm, I'm going to invite you guys to stand and we're going to worship Jesus. And, and I just want some self-examination. This is, this is a letter of self-examination. Maybe, maybe you need to pray as, as, as Pastor Andy leads in worship. Is Holy Spirit, 
am I letting you renew my mind? Am I letting you change me? Am I agreeing with the world or am I agreeing with your word? Maybe you need to pray, Holy Spirit, help me to receive what Pastor Ryan spoke over me, what you say about me, because I feel so condemned in my faith, but I just need to rest in your mercy. And if that's you, man, I want you to rest in God's mercy. That's what he wants you. That's a place of safety. Maybe you're here today and you say, I just need to give my life to Jesus. I need to repent. I've walked away from him. I'm going to be right up here, and I would love to pray with you and introduce you to Jesus or reintroduce you to Jesus. But what I don't want to do is just to walk out of here the same way we walked in. Whenever we hear the word of God, whether it be an encouraging, I pray this is encouraging, or, or challenging, but let it melt us. The same sun that hardens the clay will, will melt the snow. Let's be snow today in the presence of God and say, God, use me however you want. I thank you because you are a good God. Let's respond as Pastor Andy leads. song we could ever sing worthy of all the praise we could ever bring you're worthy of every breath we could ever breathe we live for you
God, we thank you for your word, Lord. Sometimes it's so challenging that makes us think way more than what we, we thought we would think. But God, your word is true. And even though it's challenging, it's good. And so, God, I pray that the word that you gave us today that challenged us, Lord, would help us to love people that we thought are unlovable, to help us to reach people that we are that we thought are unreachable. God, because it's all about you. Everything is about you. How we live, how we speak, how we think. God, I pray right now that you would help us change our minds as we go out today, as we go out into our week, as we go out into our families, our work. God, I pray that you would help us and challenge our thinking to be more like you, to love like you, to love people like you. We thank you for who you are, Jesus, and we thank you for what you spoke over us and who we are in you. And Lord, I pray right now that that would rest on people's hearts this week, that they would know who they are in Christ, who they are, who you say we are, Lord, because we are yours. And there's nothing, nothing better than being yours. Lord, we thank you for that. We thank you for the love that you have for us. I pray that you would bless each and every person as they go out this week, that you would give them opportunities to share their faith, that you would encourage them, and that you would let joy rest upon their lives. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. We love you guys. Have an amazing 4th of July. We'll see you Wednesday for the prayer service.